And the reason I was able to do the things I did in Asia over those 40 years was because I was just too dumb to know that I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I was there. It's not our ability, it's our availability. God promises in Joel 2.28 to pour out His Spirit on all humanity. Welcome to Global Outpouring, where we contend for that promise outpouring and we equip for that outpouring so that we may engage in that very outpouring. I'm Philip Buss. And I'm Sharon Buss. Welcome to the podcast today. We have with us again our dear friend, Dr. Peter Snyder, who has been a missionary for many years, and he has contended and equipped and engaged in the outpouring uh, many, many times, and he's seen such amazing things. He's a missionary's missionary, and he is going to share with us some more about what's next in missions. Welcome to the podcast today. Thanks so much for joining us. Before we get started, we want to invite you to go to our website, globaloutpouring.net, and follow up on the the previous episode that we had with Dr. Peter Snyder. If you didn't hear it, you'll want to go back and hear that. And he was also with us on episode 75. And and you'll want to hear those. Those are really, really powerful. And we'd love to hear some feedback from you. There's a, there's a place on our webpage for that. Or you can write to us at, at uh, feedback at globaloutpouring.org. Thank you so much for joining us today. And Peter, we're so glad that you're with us again today. I, we so enjoyed this last episode, and we, we want to go a little deeper in what you're feeling about missions and what's next for missions. Okay, well, let's go back where um, I read the scriptures. I call them post-COVID scriptures because of traveling, <laughs> traveling the United States. People say, what are we supposed to do next? We've just been so broken, and of course, we all know the scripture in Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us, and on the third day, raise us up. And what I said in the first lesson was that um, there's a, a step of faith, a leap of faith that's required on our part when we are raised up after the broken things, because he can't do anything unless we're teachable and allowed to be broken so that he can rebuild in the days ahead. Some people call this a reset. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. And the other scripture is another one from the Old Testament. It's Habakkuk chapter two. And it kind of runs parallel to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 20, that he said, remain in the calling wherein you were called because people say, what am I going to do next? Well, you've been trained to do certain things. And what is your calling? Well, I know what mine is. And you really know what yours is by now. And I'm talking to um, our generation of Christians. And uh, this is beautiful. He says, I will stand my watch, chapter 2, verse 1 of Habakkuk, and set myself on the rampart. That means stay in the word as a sentinel and not be moved and watch to see what he will say to me while you're in the word and what I will answer when I'm what? Corrected, Corrected. or mm -hmm. rebuilt. Here, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, and he may run who reads it, for the vision is for an appointed time. But the end, it will speak, and it will not lie, though it tarries, wait for it, because it surely will come, it will not tarry. And like I said the last time, that seems like a contradiction of terms, the, though it tarry, it will not tarry. That means when these things come about, and the promises of the Lord are revealed, they won't wait another minute longer, and we'll all know it, and we'll be right in the midst of our calling. But the thing that I think that we need to know here as I get into this um, second installment is um, we have to be very discerning. Uh, that's, hmm. that's key. Mama. And, you know, I, in our generation and many of us, you know, we thought any spiritual manifestation was the Holy Spirit. Oh, did you feel the Holy Spirit? Oh, did and, you know, it's not ever really when it comes to the Holy Spirit about feelings. It's about faith. There were times in China when I thought, I don't feel good about this at all. 
But it was the very thing that I had to do. And that was a leap of faith, too. I remember watching that movie, Saving Private Ryan. The one mm. uh, Luke oh, wow. sergeant said, yeah, Captain, I don't feel good about this. And after they'd been all through that stuff, the captain looked at him like he was a nut and said, since when have any of us felt good about any of this? <laughs> and they had, so this is what we have to do because it's what's given to us. In other words, it's our calling too, you know, to give what the Lord has taught us and led us in and brought us to. And my problem, and I'm saying this to help others, is that, um, you know, sometimes I couldn't discern what was right or wrong, which was good or evil, because in my teaching and in my generation, we thought if it was spiritual, it was had to have been of God. But that's not necessarily no. true. No. Mm -hmm. I was um, in the Quinn, Maine. a deceiver. Yeah. The, he, I was an angel of light. I was in my office in Quinn, Maine, and I was looking out the window, and the heavens opened. I never saw anything like it in my life. It was fascinating. It was brilliant. I saw the angels flitting and moving and shooting from one place to another, and the colors were extraordinary. And I, I didn't even know some of the colors, and I was astonished sounded by it and the phone rang and it all disappeared my baptist oh. friend down in mungza he said what you doing and i said if i told you you wouldn't believe it anyway and so i hung up on him and i said lord jesus show me this vision again and nothing i said oh please i didn't see enough and i didn't understand it please open my and nothing i was ready to walk out in frustration and it opened up again and it was amazing. And I started observing what was happening. And it was like the Lord was saying, and he doesn't speak as a man speaks, but he speaks in wisdom and things we know the word. He said, it's beautiful, isn't it? I said, it sure is. And it was like he said, do you think it's good? I said, it must be, Lord. Look how beautiful it is. He said, that's a war. <laughs> wow. There are principalities there that hate your guts, and this is a war between the angels to keep keep the kingdom in balance, what needs to be done. And when I heard that, I backed away and I thought, I have to be wow. very discerning That's right. in these last days because the devil does come as an angel of light. And yeah. when we enter into the spiritual realm, baptized in the Holy Spirit, we enter into the whole arena Mm -hmm. of the spiritual entities from the highest principality down to the lowest d ugly demon that crawls in the dirt, you know, all of them. And mm -hmm. so that's why we have to be teachers now because we have learned to discern and know what's a trick and what isn't. Because mm -hmm. in these last days, Lord said, there are going to be deceptions that come. Oh, mm -hmm. it's a marvel. Oh, it's a fascinating thing. But no, we have to be careful because that's where judgment comes and it begins with us and we have to learn to observe. Yeah, Jesus said that that uh, if it were possible, it even possible. if it were possible, yeah. even the very elect would be deceived. And, and that's where... You know, he kind of leaves room for, is it possible? Yeah, well, even uh, deceived. Sounds like it could be. They might be deceived to a point and then wake up and learn mm -hmm. something. Yeah. So anyway, you know, I'm putting this um, in um, context to what's next in missions. And I said the last time what's changing in missions and since COVID and 911, overseas missions isn't the same because really the gospel great commission, co-mission, is the... Um, go into the, all the world and preach the gospel. And we really have over the last 2000 years. I was part of that. We reached the unreached tribes. And I knew my friends were reaching up in another area by India and Tibet, the last of the unreached areas. And we saw it done. And then there came a time when the Chinese pastors said, we want to go into those areas, but we've never been to these closed areas and these tribes. Can you lead us? And I thought, here I am, a white man leading the Chinese into their own country <laughs> to these places. And I thought, once they get in there, uh -huh. it's going to be finished. I said, how many are you going to send? Well, we're going to send a hundred tomorrow. And I thought, oh, uh -huh. my goodness, we got motorcycles, sent them into those areas and away they went. So what is missions today? Since the gospel has been reached in every country and there are Christians in there finishing the work, what missions is today, oh, we'll go over and train the pastors. We'll go over and help them that are already there. We'll be a support. 
will give them teaching as they're going into the Muslim nations, reaching and finishing the work back to Jerusalem. But that's what it is now. So the traditional idea of missions or the great white hope, <laughs> we laughed and called them, <laughs> that day is really done. All right. And um, what there's to be reached is the Muslim nations, but they already know Jesus. Mm -hmm. They just don't accept him the way we do. And back to Jerusalem, the Jews, that's a, a hard mission field. And I was told when I first went there, uh, you know, they don't accept the gospel that fast at all. Not only did they not, but they were so antagonistic to it because they know Jesus too. And they just haven't received him and they won't because they look at him in a historical context and not as their savior. Mm -hmm. What his name means, Yeshua, is Savior. And uh, so that, there, there might need to be some contending in the spirit realm. Yeah, but more than that, love, because yes. love beats it all. When I was there, you know, I made a lot of dumb mistakes because I was with the Orthodox all the time that I was there. And uh, they said, Peter, you can't do this. And you did our country. You can't touch the, the women in the synagogue. But here you are hugging them. And I said, oh, I didn't know. And he said, don't stop. They love it. And, you know, because I was different. I was unique. I just was ignorant of those things. And the reason I was able to do the things I did in Asia over those 40 years was because I was just too dumb to know that I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I was there. It's not our ability. It's our availability. Yeah. Amen. That's the truth. So, you know, I've had opportunities to lecture there and, um, my last trip was with Sharon and Philip to the Philippines. And as we were leaving, that was when the lockdown for COVID started. Mm -hmm. Even Sharon and Philip had gone, made the mistake by going, getting a cheap ticket through Shanghai. And then when they finished with the Philippines, they got into Atlanta and they said, uh oh, they saw that they had been to China. And it, as they say in Israel, no picnic. this is not a picnic. <laughs> and it wasn't for any of us, and even everything shut down. But they said now that the um, doors for coming back into America now and the COVID restrictions have been lifted. And I'm excited about that. But we trained the pastors in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. There's no other unreached areas that they weren't reaching. But they needed that, and they loved that because they were the Baptists, and they had been greatly awakened by the Holy Spirit. And they said— we need to know more about this because there were healings and there were miracles and power of the Holy Spirit. And so we've been, done seminars there for the last seven years. And Sharon and Philip taught on worship. And I started dancing right up front when they were singing. And it was so wonderful. One of the pastors got up and left and said, undignified. And I said, <laughs> like David, good, I'll be more undignified than that. <laughs> so... We taught them something, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> the power of God. That's for sure. It was a tremendous time. We certainly enjoyed ourselves on that trip. So when you ministered for us on our Friday night live worship, and we'll put a link down in the description, you gave us a great illustration from your life about judgment and justice. Would you tell us about that? Okay. We're all looking for justice and judgment to come, but, you know, it's never what it appears to be because it's very, very difficult to contend with when it happens. I was in Haiti during the revolution, and like I said in the last podcast, I was um, the head of the mission down there where my father was the president, and he said he's the boss, and I was stuck there when the revolution came feeding 50,000 kids a day. I couldn't leave or else they wouldn't be fed, and um, the times got so difficult there that I wasn't equipped to deal with these things, especially when they came to kill us at our house. And it was just a horrible time, but God saved us miraculously. And I said, what am I going to do? Because even missionaries were turning against missionaries and the Haitians said, it's your fault that these things are happening. Said the same thing to me in China during the Chinese student uprising. They said, it's your fault that these things are happening to us. I said, yeah, me and George Bush, yeah, we planned every, the every, whole thing. Everybody's <laughs> looking for somebody else to blame. Yeah. So in Haiti, at that point, I learned a great lesson about judgment. Because they were turning against me, and I thought, how can I keep this together? And I didn't know what to do. So I called my dad, <laughs> and he was a powerful man. They called him the general, and uh, he was in Canada, and I was in Haiti. He said, Dad, help. These guys are just tearing things to pieces. I don't know what I'm going to do. 
And uh, he said, I'm coming. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. And I was so excited to hear he was coming. And like three days later, I went to the airport to get him. I gave him a hug, and I was so happy to see him because we were really one. I know what Jesus meant. I and the Father are one. And we went together, and we went to that mission house, and all the blood drained out of their faces and their jaws hit the floor when they saw my dad. And he said, you, you, and you, get out of here. You four, go into the office and sit there until I get there. The rest of you, go about your work, and I'll deal with you later. And I just started shaking, and I heard in that office, there's people wailing and gnashing their teeth. And I thought, this is terrible. It's scary. It's judgment. And he said, now let's go out to the village, Pete. And we got in that van, and we drove out there. I had 280 teachers and other workers that were in there that had threatened to kill me and everything else. And we got in there. They didn't know my dad was there. And we walked in there all sitting there with these mean scowls on their faces, and they saw him, and the blood drained out of their faces, too, and they changed colors. And he walked <laughs> right up there on the front, and he stood there with an authority that I thought, I wish I had that. And he said, you want to kill my son? Well, I've come so that you could kill me. He said, in the old days, they picked up stones. Come on, let's go out back. And he turned and started going out, and I just saw that spirit of conviction. Mm -hmm. come over them like probably happened at the cross when they beat their breasts and turned away. What have we done? From that time on, things turned around. And that's judgment because, you know, I had a list of these teachers that had to go that had been playing games with me. I couldn't do anything about it. But when it was time, mm -hmm. it was time. It didn't tarry any further than below after that. Chinese student uprising, the same thing. You know, we thought, what are we going to do? But in the last 40 years, I've gained an authority that my father had, and I learned that it came from speaking the truth. Mm -hmm. Always speaking the truth, because that's your shield, and that's your buckler. And where do we find the truth? We find it in the Word of God. And my point that I didn't make when I told that story, and Sharon asked me to share it to you, um, was that uh, James and John's mother came to Jesus and said, uh, can my father, or can, can James and John sit at your right hand and your left hand? And Jesus said, well, that's not for me to say right now. It's not for me to give. It's Father in heaven. But in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, he says, those will sit with me in my mm. throne. And yeah. I thought mm -hmm. as the f son of the father there, you know, I had all authority and I was sitting in his throne. And when it's time for the rewards, he's going to give us five cities, 10 cities, mm -hmm. according to what mm -hmm. we've done with what we've got. Right. And some won't get anything. Some will bury talents in the ground. And it's going to be a time of reckoning because judgment begins in the house, house of the of Lord. In the house yeah. of the Lord. And so I learned a great lesson about that. And I thought, I liked being the boss's son until the trouble <laughs> came. And then I realized what responsibility I have. Mm -hmm. And people say, Pete, where do you get that anointing? Pray for me that you, we can have that anointing. <laughs> and I said, the anointing is loving everyone. Mm -hmm. I love the police when they arrested me. I love the Communist Party members. I saw many communists be or cry, become Christians, and the police would become Christians because I just loved them so much, and I learned it from the Chinese pastors that they kicked and they beat and they spit on and in the prisons, just beat them every morning, and they would laugh, and they said, what are you laughing for? I don't know. I'm just so happy. Wow. And I wanted to be with them. And I said, this is something that transcends anything that I learned in the Christian church in America. And they say, persecution is good. And in the last days with this mix, we're going to see wonderful things happen, but we're going to see tremendous persecution. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese say, that's good to be persecuted. And Paul said, yes, in my weakness, I'm strong, but I thought, not me. <laughs> you know, if I can get away without it, I will. And uh, I try to avoid it by using wisdom. But the day's coming 
That's the day of reckoning for everyone and judgment is and justice. The people we're looking at today said they should be severely judged for the things they're doing to our country. You have to be very careful because we have to love them too. And that's the hardest part right now. And um, I love you and I'm glad that I can tell you about these things. We sure appreciate that you do tell us about these things, Peter. So you were telling us earlier before we started this recording uh, about the what the Lord showed you on your recent trip to Washington, D.C. Would you share that with our listeners? Well, it was interesting because recently I was in Washington and I was in the Lincoln Memorial and I just wanted to get away from everybody. And I was looking at what he wrote on the walls, Gettysburg Address and the prophecies that Lincoln gave. And um, it's like I heard in my heart. What do you think Lincoln's greatest desire was to do? But when he got shot, he couldn't finish it. And I thought, I don't have an idea. And I got this, I don't know, a premonition or something that his great desire was to go to Palestine. And that's what they called it in those days. And I pulled out my iPhone right away and I said, had Lincoln ever been to Palestine? I said, no, he never had. But that was the last thing that he said before he died. Hmm. He wanted to go there. And I thought, well, I'm going there. And I thought, what do you want me to say? What do you want the rest of us to say? And he said, what's on the walls? Truth. Truth, Mm -hmm. yeah. Just speak the truth and don't mingle it with anything else, extra, you know, extra scriptural or whatever. Just speak the truth. And the testimony of your life speaks like the testimony of Jesus in his life, which is the spirit of prophecy. And that's what everybody understands in the end. And that's what's going to be um, optimal in these last days, the truth, because it sets people free. Even in China, they said, we don't want the Bible. What are you doing bringing in here? I said, what's wrong with the Bible? It's the number one best-selling book in the world. They go, no, no, no. And then I would say to them, I said, Jesus' names mean salvation to the police. You don't want to die and go to hell, do you? No. But they all believe in hell over there, you know. And so that was what I said. I said, I love you. I want to talk to you about these things. This can be a friendship exchange. Or turn these things into an international incident. So, you know, we have to speak the truth and we can't doctor it or candy coat it or anything else. Amen. That's it. The truth sets you free. So, Peter, what truth did you learn about the authority of the believer when you were in China? The Lord really showed you something special there. And the beautiful thing that I learned, you know, I thought it took experience. I thought it took uh, nurturing and cultivating uh, a life as a minister to be an active, uh, mature minister and using the gifts of the Holy Spirit because I'm to pray for everyone. And in China, that's a lot of pastors, but I laid hands on them and prayed for everyone. Speaking the gifts, Paul said, stir up the gifts that have been given to you by the laying on of hands and learning to stir up what you've already got as walking in faith and taking these steps of faith. And um, I thought, well, I'm not at the point yet where I can really bring a revival here. And the Lord stopped me. And he said, you absolutely were from the first day you became a Christian. Mm -hmm. You've had that power in you that raised Jesus from the dead at the very beginning. That's what the gospel is. And so, you know, all these people I prayed for in China, I mean, there's so many variations of things that happened and signs and wonders followed, you know, because I just believed and looked ahead and I didn't care to see results from anything. I just was faithful. You know, it's not whether we even succeed or fail. It's whether we're obedient. And I did these things and I got up to Anhui province and, um, in Hefei and I was in this underground church and I was teaching the pastors in there and, I was so cold and I was in this back room and I said to my friend that I took along, you go in and teach there for an hour and then I'll take the second hour. And I got under this quilt and I felt being bit up by bed bugs and threw that thing off. So I rather freeze to death. And there was a something <laughs> going on in that other room, something being knocked over and everything. What's going on there? And this guy comes running into the room and knocking things over. He looked wild and he stared at me and then he ran out when he saw me. And I thought, what was was that it was a maniac he was demon possessed and my friend came and said pete i can't get anything done that guy's insane 
He's possessed. And, and right when he said that, he that kid run, come running in, and I jumped up and grabbed him in a headlock and started wrestling him over to the bed and sat down with his head in my arm, holding as tight as I could and rubbing the top of his head, saying, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And I love you. Settle down. Jesus loves you. I love you. And it's just jumping like a horse until he finally started settling because I felt the Holy Spirit coming over him. And when the Holy Spirit came over him because of the anointing I had, I said, get out. And I commanded that demon to go and the guy jerked. And he was immediately felt filled with the Holy Spirit that was in me too. And it was an amazing thing because it was instantaneous. And he looked up at me in his right mind that second. And this woman that very minute came in and she started groaning. A great big lady said, oh, I came here and I asked your friend to pray for me three times and my legs are just killing me. I can't even hardly walk home. He prayed for me and nothing happened. In that very minute, I had that boy on my arm around him in a kind way, and I said, do you see what you've been given? You have that, and you can give it mm -hmm. to her. He looked at me like I didn't know I was talking about. I said, you can pass this on. And I, we both stood up, and I slapped his hand right on her head. And she, we prayed, and she let out a scream. You should have seen it. And her chest hit the ceiling and started jumping like a Super Bowl right out the door. And in there, started praying for everyone else. And the revival was on. And I turned around, and I looked at that boy, and his arms were in heaven. And mm. he was crying. And his father came walking in. And I said, get him out of here. It was a familiar spirit. Mm. And we have that authority at the very beginning, but Satan doesn't want you to believe you can use this authority. When we were Christians during the Jesus movement, we sat around and we were hippies, all undone, <laughs> you know, dope smoking hippies and light up our cigarettes. And we looked at each other and we all had one thing. We had Jesus. He saved us. We had a testimony, and that testimony was powerful. And these kids in those days turned out to be some of the greatest missionaries that the 20th century has ever seen as God finished a work after that Jesus movement and sent them into the mission field. I know I worked with them, and I thought there is a lesson to be taught here to the new people that are coming into an understanding of who they are in Christ and that's the what's spirit. next. Mm. That's what's next. Cracking the religious nut, not by trying to convince them like Stephen did. They killed Stephen, mm -hmm. but by loving them, yeah. staying with them, caring about them, taking the abuse and criticism, and being laughed at. Paul said we're the offscoring of the whole world. Yeah. But that's a good place to be because it sure makes us unique in Christ <laughs> Jesus. And we are. You're unique. Would you please tell us the story of how the Holy Spirit fell in that university, that great revival that started because one girl was really sick? Oh. Oh uh, my! Do you want? Do I have time to uh, tell yes, that? Yes, you have time to tell that because oh. because this okay. is this is a significant thing about <laughs> about outpouring. This is great, and, and how God uses <laughs> us, no matter what we understand. Yeah. This yeah. is the best story in the whole world yeah. because I was there in the university and for six years, we didn't see anybody in China come to the Lord. And we were in that area where they'd never seen foreigners ever. And we were the only foreigners they'd ever seen because they didn't even have TVs back then. They're all wearing the blue suits. And I came up to the senior class and took role like I usually do. And one girl wasn't there. And uh, I said, where is she? Oh, she's sick. And I never saw that anybody was ever sick in my class. And um, I said, how bad is it? Said, well, very bad. And I said, well, let's pray for her. Oh, no, we don't believe in that foreign superstition. And I said, OK, get into your composition books and let's go. Two or three days later, I came there and she still wasn't there. And I said, where is she? Her name was Little Horse, Shama. And she said, Oh, it's really bad. The whole college is taking up money because she's from a very poor family. And we sent her to the best hospital, number one people's hospital in Quimming. And I said, well, let's pray for her. And they said, well, we believe in science. We don't believe in that. I said, okay. So I came about two or three days later for an American Lit class. And I went in there and they were crying. 
And I said, what in the world is going on here? And I said, where's Shao Ma? They said, Tashuo, Taman, Taijing Budzai, which is a, a euphemism for she's not, she's passed away and not here still. And I said, I can see that, but the euphemism was she was dead. But you didn't get it. I didn't no. get it. And there she was laying dead in the morgue in Quiming. And uh, I said, well, let's pray for her that she will be here. And they looked at me like I was a nut. And they didn't say anything. And then finally, her friend that sat in front of her said, you mean even now, Mr. Snyder, we can pray? And I said, well, sure. We can pray for her right now. And I finally- Because you didn't know she was dead. No, I didn't know she was dead. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I just, my Chinese wasn't that good at that point. I didn't understand the euphemism. And uh, so they prayed. I said, thank God I finally got these people to pray. And what happened was in the morgue, the light shot up through Shama, and she sat right straight up on that gurney and took a deep breath and reached out to grab that light and let out a scream and jumped off that gurney and started following that bright light out the door and right out of the hospital. She was following <laughs> it down the street. And they didn't have cell phones in those days. She And it stopped at this kiosk, and she was amazed by this thing. And she picked up the phone and dialed the dormitory. And her friend, Helen, the one who said, can we still pray even now, Mr. Steiner? Answered the phone. She said, Helen, this is Shalma. And Helen almost dropped over dead because the whole <laughs> college knew she was dead. Only nut that didn't know was me. And she, I, she said, Mr. Steiner, go task Mr. Steiner what am I supposed to do? I'm following this bright light down the street of Quimming. And I said, tell her. She ran to my house and I said, tell her that's an angel and she's been healed and come back to the college because I've seen this happen a number of times, that bright light coming in and healing people. And she was there that next week. And I mean, where nobody was Christians, more than half of my senior class became Christians. We showed the Jesus movie on the fifth floor of that college and rocked that campus for Jesus. And people were coming to the Lord on that campus left and right. And the government people weren't happy about it, but it's, <laughs> their sound had already gone forth. And it was the most amazing thing. And, uh, they started winning souls around the area and those uh, tribal people were throwing their idols in the garbage dump and it went like you never saw the girl that was ahead of the propaganda became a Christian. Her name was Xiao Yin <laughs> and she would uh, do the propaganda and play the uh, Chinese marches and all these government things. But I gave her a tape of Benny Hinn, Jesus is Alive. And they started playing Jesus is Alive on that campus. And they would be marching down to get their food with Jesus is Alive. And he was on that campus. But with that <laughs> comes persecution. Uh -huh. yeah. And that's when the police started calling me in. Like I said the last time, Peter, forbidden. Forbidden what? They didn't want the Bible. I said, what's the wrong with the Bible? It's a number one best-selling book in the world. No. And I said, Jesus' name means salvation. You don't want to go to hell, do you? No, 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 no. But, you know, that's Peter. He's crazy. And so I got away with so much just because I was different. I was a foreigner. And I want to say to everybody here, our citizenship is is in heaven yes. right we are different we are unique we are individual we're not jesus clones and i'm glad we're not because jesus loves the diversity mm -hmm. and he uses all of us and in the kingdom when we see it all come together that's going to be the glory of it the glory of the nations beautiful so be yourself be yourself and do the thing that god puts into your heart and make sure that it lines up with the word but do it Amen. Amen. So pray, pray for the people that are listening, would you please? Yeah, Father, I just thank you for this group that's listening because this is appointed for today. It's commissioned, and I thank you so much for their lives and what they've been through, you know, through this time of breaking and through this time of not knowing what's next and of being rebuilt in your Holy Spirit that's coming into all of us right now to finish the work. Rise up among us, Lord Jesus, and give us the boldness to go forth and finish what you've purposed and started around the world. Lord, we pray for the nations. We pray for the Muslims. We pray 
pray for Jerusalem and we yes. pray for our government, Lord Jesus, mm -hmm. government founded, one nation under God. And we thank you for our legacy and we thank you for the covenant you made with us and for Jerusalem as Washington and Jerusalem line up together in these last days. And we will look to see what you will say as we stand our watch on the rampart yes. and what we will do when we are corrected. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Your review helps the podcasting platform suggest this podcast to other listeners who are also looking for a great move of the Holy Spirit. Check out our website at globaloutpouring.org to find out more information, read our blogs, connect with us, and donate. You can also browse our web store for life-changing anointed books. Until next time, this is Sharon Buss. And I'm Philip Buss. God bless you with his overwhelming, loving presence. Mm -hmm.